A warm welcome to today's talk, Wednesday the 13th of November. Now today we want to be looking at a peer-reviewed journal from the British Medical Journal. This is it here. Excess mortality across countries in the Western world since COVID-19 pandemic. Our world in data estimates. January 2020 to December 2022. Work mostly carried out in the Netherlands and we see British Medical Journal Public Health. So this is a, uh, a fully peer-reviewed paper, although there is a concern that we'll look at later, and it is concerning that there is a concern, in fact. But first of all, let's look at some of the detail on the paper. Now, um, Our World in Data, of course, is a site we've looked at many times. There's the links to Our World in Data. That's the reference they prefer, and check out the information that they give there as well. So a very highly reputable, well-recognised source. Now, introduction to this paper. Excess mortality during the COVID-19 pandemic has been substantial. Includes not only deaths from sars coronavirus 2 infection, but also deaths related to the indirect effects of the health strategies. So deaths from different causes we're seeing here. Uh, insight into excess death rates in years following WHO's pandemic declaration is crucial, absolutely crucial, for government leaders and policymakers to evaluate their health crisis policies. And of course, the question is, how well is this being done? How objectively or otherwise is it being evaluated? Let's carry on. Um, the study explores excess uh, mortality in the Western world from 2020 until 2022. Although the COVID-19 vaccines were provided to guard civilians from suffering morbidity and mortality by the COVID-19 virus, suspected adverse events have been documented as well. And, and these are direct quotes from the uh, publication. They're just saying what is obviously true, that we have multiple data points for. Method they used... Um, all cause mortality reports were abstracted from countries using our world in data database, which we've used many times. Excess mortality deviation. So excess mortality, what is it? A deviation between the reported number of deaths in a country during a certain week or month and the expected number. So very simple. How many deaths were there? How many deaths would we expect? If there was more deaths than we would expect, which there was. Um, that's the excess mortality. It's very simple. Now, they do use a slightly more complicated statistical model. It's called Karlinsky and Cobart 2021. Well recognised. It's the model used by Our World in Data, in fact. Now, I'm not going to go into the statistics in detail, but it is in the paper. It's well explained and it's well recognised and accepted statistical ways of analysing data. This model uses historical deaths in a country from 2015 to 2019 and accounts for seasonal variations and year-to-year -year mortality, uh, trends in mortality. So um, what were the results that were obtained? Uh, not too good, unfortunately. Uh, January the 1st, 2020 until the 31st of December 2022. So it's a full three-year period. Uh, the total number of deaths in 47 countries in the Western world was uh, 3,098,456. Now, excess mortality was documented in 41 countries uh, in 2022. So 87% of countries had excess mortality in 2020. 89% uh, of countries in 2021, 42 countries com comprising 42 countries. Of the 47, 43 countries, so even higher in 2022 when we might expect it to be going down. In 2020, the year of the COVID pandemic onset and implementation of containment measures, 1,033,122 excess deaths. Now, the P score is just, it's slightly complicated, but basically what it means is that the percentage of excess deaths. So deaths were 11.4% higher uh, than we would have expected. In 2021, the year in which both containment measures and COVID vaccines were used to address virus spread and infection, um, the highest number of excess deaths was reported, uh, 1,256,924, 13.8%. So it had gone up in 2020 when we would have expected it to be higher. 
when no one was immune to the virus or a limited immunity to the virus, 11.4, in 2021, after the containment measures and the vaccine rollout, 13.8%. That was the highest year of excess mortality. In 2022, when most containment measures were lifted and COVID vaccines were continued, uh, 0.8 to 8, 888,000, 0.8 of a million excess deaths. And there the excess P-score was 8.8%. So highest in 2021, but still remaining high in 2022. And of course, the vast majority of these later deaths, especially not attributable to COVID, attributable to multiple different pathologies, but not particularly related to COVID. Heart disease, strokes, blood clots, multiple different pathologies. So, conclusions. Excess mortality uh, has remained high in Western world for three consecutive years. Despite the implementation of COVID measures and COVID vaccines. This raises serious concerns. Nothing to disagree with there. It's clearly serious concerns. Government leaders and policymakers need to thoroughly investigate underlying causes of persistent excess mortality. Um, I think we've mentioned that on this channel once or twice before. Why aren't we seeing official reports on this? Stripping it down to its bare bones and getting the causes finally identified so that excess deaths can be prevented in the future. Surely this is what government and policy makers would want to do. It's what you and I want to do, I'm sure. More detail, previous research confirmed profound underreporting of adverse events of vaccine, including deaths after immunisation. So we know there's profound underreporting. Profound. And we've looked at various reports on this, both from the uh, from the UK and from the States. You know, it's sometimes just a few percent of adverse events reported. Sometimes it's 10 percent of serious adverse events have reported, but the majority are not reported. Very often because people have a particular intervention and then they might develop some adverse reaction, but they don't realise it's an adverse reaction. They think they've just got sick. The penny doesn't drop. The uh, dots are not often uh, connected. And I know from the comments that there's been um, thousands of similar experiences. A consensus is also lacking in the medical community regarding concerns that mRNA vaccine might cause more harm than initially forecast. Well, some people think they might cause more harm than initially forecast. But opinion is divided. We have looked at evidence on this channel, but we can't go over that now. But the evidence is significant. Direct from paper again, French studies suggest that COVID-19 mRNA vaccines are gene therapy products requiring long-term stringent adverse events monitoring. Now, let's think about this. They are mRNA vaccines. They are a gene therapy because they carry genetic information. I've always taught that a gene is the amount of genetic information required to make one protein, say a spike protein, for example. So a yeah, gene product sounds pretty reasonable to me. And do they need long-term evaluation? Well, obviously, so of course they do. Why does this even need mentioning? But we agree with the French studies, all, all referenced, of course, in the paper. Although the desired immunisation through vaccination occurs in immune cells, some studies report a broad bry distribution and persistence of mRNA in many organs for weeks, maybe even longer. Batch-dependent heterogeneity in uh, toxicity in mRNA vaccine was found in Denmark. And of course, we have talked to uh, Dr. Vibeka Manika about that on the program uh, two or three times. Um, some batches cause more adverse reactions than others, according to that Danish data, which was also replicated in Sweden, I think it was. Simultaneous onset of excess mortality in COVID vaccine in Germany, 
provides a safety signal warranting further investigation. Again, this is reference, so simultaneous onset of excess mortality in COVID vaccinations. Yeah, I mean, why not further investigation? Why not? Let's be open to all possibilities. That's what science is. Consider all possibilities in our struggle to find truth. Despite these concerns, clinical trial data requires uh, required to further investigate these associations and not shared with the public. Why isn't this data being shared with the public? We've asked this question before. We've even become a little frustrated from time to time. Why don't we have data openness and transparency? Now, I think there's real hope that in the next, early next year, we will have this data released from the United States, and then we'll know. If uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr. takes a position of leadership, he will release this data unless something gets to him first. But uh, he will release this data, I'm sure, then we'll know. Maybe there's a few people a little anxious about this in the States at the moment, and by extrapolation, every country in the world. Because if we find out that there's correlations that are causal in the United States, it would be absurd to say, well, yes, there's causal correlations in the United States, but in the UK and in Canada and New Zealand, they're only coincidence. A lot of people are nervous at the moment. I'm quite sure about that. Why not preempt the situation and release the data now? We have statisticians standing by to analyse the data. Were it released? Which it isn't. Autopsies to confirm uh, actual death causes are seldom done, so we need more pathology. Some are done, of course. And not only that, we've had uh, interesting data from embalmers who've been often doing the job that pathologists would be expected to do, I would have thought. Again, we've had the privilege of interviewing them on this channel. Government, governments may be unable to release their data with detailed stratification by calls, Poor governments unable to release it. it must be very difficult for them. Um, and, and for big companies that hold this data as well. It's probably in someone's locked office who's gone on holiday or something. Um, although this information could help indicate whether COVID-19 infection, indirect effects of containment measures, COVID vaccines or other overlooked factors play an underpinning role. So is it COVID infections? There's been an awful lot of them recently. Don't seem to be causing too much harm now. Indirect effects of containment measures, quite possible. COVID-19 vaccines or other overlooked factors. Let's find out. But probably won't find out till the uh, change of administration in the United States. Now, um, the authors here are... Um, well accomplished. This is one of the authors here, uh, Saskia. Apologies, ma'am, for pronouncing your name wrong. <laughs> but we see uh, she is well published. Self-reported late effects of childhood cancer survivors in Kenya. Childhood cancer care. We see extensive publications in paediatric oncology in reputable journals. So a very well published uh, author. And we can go on here to page two. And on and on and on. So highly published medical author. And here's one of the authors here, uh, Kurt Jan Kaspers. Again, uh, full professor. Collaborates all over the place. <coughs> Good grief. <laughs> A lot more contacts than me. Um, and again, very extensive list of quality publications. And we can actually view the other 566 research outputs from, <laughs> from uh, Professor Gertjan. Uh, very well published uh, academic indeed. Who's clearly taken a risk 
uh, writing this paper. Why do I say that? Because we have this. This is an expression of concern. Now, it greatly concerns me that there's an expression of concern. Um, the integrity team and editors are investigating issues raised regarding the quality and messaging in this work and various other uh, provisos. And then it goes on to say this study does not establish... It has been claimed that the work implies a direct causal link between COVID-19 vaccination and mortality. It has been claimed. Well, if it's been claimed, I can't see it being claimed in the paper. We're certainly not making that claim, of course not. If others choose to make erroneous claims, how is that the fault of the authors? It concerns me that this concern is there. The research looked only at trends in excess mortality over time, not its causes. Yes, that's the way I read this paper. Why is this paper being concerned over for what my interpretation of it doesn't say? Anyway, I've put the link there. Look at it for yourself. See if you agree with me or you agree with those expressing concern. Um... I can't say I'm concerned by the quality of the paper. To me, it seemed quite excellent, or indeed by the quality of the uh, academics, at least the two I checked out, involved in the writing. So there it is. Look at it for yourself. So that's the end of today's uh, video. Um, hopefully we'll be finding out all sorts of stuff when data is made public in the United States. Who knows, it might be all made public in the UK next week. Right. So that is all I wanted to say today. What I'm going to do now is show you some pictures. Now, we've just celebrated uh, Remembrance Day. Remembering those that uh, died in previous conflicts. This picture was taken in, uh, I'm pretty sure it was September. Um, September 1918, in the hospital where I myself worked and lectured. And uh, it's uh, taken from a glass plate, and it's amazing the quality of the resolution. We look into the faces of the, uh, the nurses who uh, looked after the injured 106 years ago now uh, in 1918. Amazing uh, quality resolution on these uh, original glass plates. We can see the individuals here. These are, uh, they've got RAMC, Royal Army Medical Corps badges. It's a long, uh, big, big, long, <laughs> big, long picture. Am I going to get some more? Just a minute. I've lost them now. I'll show you them again another time. Uh, but, uh, Interesting to see, see the faces of those that have uh, have gone before. Where is it? I don't know where it's gone now. Anyway, we'll find it again and I'll show you some more because it's fascinating just to see the uh, the individuals who went before us and cared just as many of us do. Often self-sacrificially cared. But for now, thank you for watching.